So welcome to uh, from the desk of the executive director. Today we are not at my desk, we are at a round table. And we're gonna have, oh, kind of a round table discussion. Well, a half circle discussion, I guess, right? So I wanna start with a, a quote from John Lewis. Um, he says, the civil rights movement was based on faith. Many of us who were participants in the movement saw our involvement as an extension of our faith. And we saw ourselves doing the work of God Segregation and racial dom discrimination were not in keeping with our faith, so we had had to do something. And I guess that's the place personally I've, I've come from, that my faith not only in a supreme being or a universal energy, but also my faith in humanity really moves me to do this work around race and racism. And so I invited these two amazing, lovely women today to be a part of, of this discussion. And we're gonna to touch on the topic, a very sensitive topic for some people, right? A topic of basically whiteness, um, just to get you thinking. So this is gonna kind of be a starter conversation to get those that are viewing this to, to really think about whiteness. And if you're not white, we certainly welcome you into this conversation because I think it'll be an interesting perspective. So one thing I like to tell people is that um, in America, um, whiteness is the norm, or white is the norm. And it's kind of our perspective. And, and, and other cultures and people that are not white um, need to kind of get in lockstep with white culture, right? Because white culture dominates. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of an interesting, for me it's really interesting because I think back to our history and kind of this myth that we're the melting pot. Well, we haven't melted, and I'm not sure we'd want to melt, right? Because we want to understand our distinctiveness, our diversity. But whiteness is one of those things that I think we expect persons of color or people that are other than white to really melt into culturally. So introduce yourselves briefly and, and tell, tell the folks what you do here. Uh, I'm Saren, I use she, her pronouns. I'm born and raised in Biloxi, and I'm currently a master's in social work student at Tulane University, and I'm an intern here at the Micah Day Center. I'm Sarah Smith. I'm the Home at Last case manager and outreach worker at Back Bay Mission. So another quote, and this is from Toni Morrison, who sadly enough passed away um, a couple of years ago in 2019. She said, in this country, American means white, everybody else has to hyphenate. And so I'm just gonna start our conversation with some questions today. Um, and I wanna ask both of you, when did you first know that you were white? When did you first know you were white? I, I grew up in like um, <clears throat> a very segregated town. Um, which is interesting because it would have been when I was in high school, late 90s, early 2000s. And I think I never paid much attention to it until you start going into classes and they start teaching you history and it seems very one-sided and it doesn't really talk about, we like, oh, here's a little blip. Oh, there was this racism we did, but we're just going to move right past that. It's almost like the Holocaust. We don't really want to talk about it. You know, we're sweeping under the rug. So I, I remember growing up in a town that had signs with the N-word on it, and we had people that were killed for being in biracial relationships. I think I knew I was white, I just didn't understand what that meant in terms of race, what my part is, what I should be doing, what conversations I should be having. I didn't understand it, and I probably have not understood it until I was in my 30s. Mm. I didn't take the time to educate myself on what it was to be white. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I, I don't necessarily think I was aware of race um, at, at a young age until maybe um, late elementary school, middle school, or high school. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with how, how I was raised. Um, my mom is of the Baha'i faith, and we grew up in community with other Baha'i people on the coast and a lot of them were black. Um, so growing up, I had like a grandmother maternal figure who was black and we spent a lot of time with our family 
our chosen family and and they were black and I think I knew that our skin was different colors but I don't think I knew that there was kind of this idea of we are different because of that um, and so it wasn't until um, yeah when I was in school kind of getting this education about history and also seeing my classmates who were maybe treated differently because they were black or hearing from other classmates who who were raised differently from me who had stereotypes and prejudices against other black children um, that I kind of recognized that there was some sort of socially constructed racial categories that were um, impacting our social relations as as children, um, and then c coming in out of that, um, in in college, I kind of became aware of like my whiteness as a privilege, and um, and something I had to navigate through in order to um, kind of be able to be responsible with with my privilege. Mm, that's powerful, both of you. Yeah. I, th I think for me it was, <clears throat> I kind of, I, like you, like both of you actually, I think I didn't really understand the construct or the idea of whiteness. Mm -hmm. I knew my skin was a different color than what was my best childhood friend Johnny. And I realized that that was a problem in kind of my little eight-year-old mind when my father said, you, you can't play with Johnny anymore because he's X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. you know. Um, <clears throat> and it's not acceptable. And so I knew there was, there was a problem, and I went back to Johnny and, and shared that, and he, he kind of held on his arm, and he said, hold your arm next to mine, and he said, you know, the only difference between us is I'm chocolate milk and you're white milk. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, what does that mean? You know, and we, we continued to be friends, to the chagrin probably of my father, but I think it wasn't until college when I started to really understand history from a deeper level, and the fact that we weren't getting <laughs> the real history, right? Mm -hmm. Especially of systemic racism and whiteness, um, and even even the stories of, of slave trade and the indigenous people and how we, we massacred them. That I think I started to realize that whiteness um, in in our cultures is, is is the norm, mm -hmm. and it's what seems to be um, that which is most acceptable. Mm -hmm. And if you aren't white. Um, you're less than and I think that's the narrative that I started to understand and I started to To kind of buck against and that's when I realized that moment in history when I was young mm -hmm. Was really transformative for the way I looked at life and I think also for me being a part of a um, Part of queer community or marginalized community has also helped me to realize that um, diversity and marginalization and oppression is such a part of Kind of every really every culture across the globe but especially it's kind of what we were somewhat established on yeah. here in the united states so another question for either of you or if you have a question do you have a question or a statement you want to share before no no i think hearing all of us talk about kind of how we developed a sense of race as as children and as adults it it makes me think about how as children you have to be socialized to understand race and and some children white children do not have to understand that at such an early age because we were considered to be the um, the norm the standard and black children are going to be treated differently and they are socialized at a young age to understand why and how. Um, and children inherently, we may be able to notice differences and see kind of the different appearances, different um, genotypes and phenotypes of one another. We notice that diversity, but we don't translate that into this category of race that mm -hmm. has a hierarchy within it um yeah yeah it's interesting you say that i think because there's this idea of i always ask the question a lot of times about 
my ideals, my thoughts, my perception is that nurture and nature, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think you're right, you know, we're nurtured um, and we're taught um, certain things and, and certain paradigms about the systems of race or around whiteness or around blackness. Mm -hmm. And there's been something, Anderson Cooper did this recently, and it's a study that was from the 1950s where they would lay out for, for children um, a range of babies with different colored skin, starting with really white skin to really dark mm -hmm. black skin and brown skin. And they'd ask the children, <clears throat> which were very young, which is the good baby, which is the bad baby, which is the baby like you? You know, which is the baby that isn't like you? Which baby would you like to play with? Which mm -hmm. baby wouldn't you like to play with? You know, which baby do you think would be, would get a spanking, which wouldn't? And inevitably, the majority of the children, even at that age, and I think they were like five, six years old, seven years old, eight years old, would, would pick the darkest skin baby as the bad baby, and the baby with light skin as, as the good baby. And it seems that somewhere there's this enculturation or this, these stories that were taught mm -hmm. about race very early on. Um, through our culture, through our media, you know, through through whatever. So, mm -hmm. did you have something to add, Sarah? Yeah, well, we're talking about school and, and teaching and things. I don't remember, you know, it wasn't until college, and I had to seek it out myself. It wasn't offered. It wasn't like, hey, you should take this class to better understand. We're, we learned about the Civil War and the Revolutionary War and the, the Tea Party, you know. But we don't read about the slave trade, and we don't read the slave diaries, and these horrible books that are just, oh, they just, they make you so sad. And so I remember being in college, I was over at USM working on my bachelor's there, and somebody was talking about, I think reparations was in the media. People mm -hmm. were talking a lot about reparations at the time, and I was like, I don't, I don't understand reparations. I had to go and learn about it. I thought, well, I don't, at some point, the onus is on me to, to educate myself because I'm not going to learn it in the history books that they gave you in college or high school. And USM actually has, um, they had African American studies from pre-slave trade, slave trade, all the way up until now. And I took all of them. I was absolutely fascinated. like gobbled it up. I'm like, we don't learn any of this. I didn't get any of this before, you know. And it was, it was eye-opening for me. And I think that's where my, my kind of journey began and that the history books are written by the winners, right? Yep, yep. The history books are written by the whites. Like we're going to tell you what you we want you to know. We know this is like a black stain on America, so we're not going to talk about the fact that we hung people and like burned their bodies and took body parts. We took people's body parts and sold them, yep. I, I, and we called them the animals. Right. It was it was incredible, incredible to me. So I feel like that's when I learned that. America's not going to teach me about racism. Like it's uh, it's my responsibility to have the hard conversations and to do the hard work and to educate myself. And I think that's where kind of the path I've been on, but I didn't start that path until my 30s and I had to seek it out myself. It was never taught to me in school. I don't ever remember there being a book about, hey, read about the slaves on the ship and their point of view and how horrible that was and families that were ripped apart on plantations right. and never to see your children again. I'm like, I can't as a mother imagine this. And I remember sitting at the beach and I have two daughters and I always said, I don't teach my daughters color. And in my brain, I'm doing the right thing, right? I'm like, I, we don't see race here. But that is also ignorant because then we're like excluding you as a race and a culture. Like your race and color is beautiful and, and we should entertain that and we should love it for all that you are. I remember they were like little, my kids were little, we were at the beach, and my daughter found a little girl to play with, and, and she was a little black girl, and my daughter and I thought, you know, hate is taught at home. These children don't know hate. They don't come out of the womb learning to hate. They're hearing it from the media, and politics, and newspapers, and Facebook, and TikTok, and Twitter, and all these avenues that people can sit behind screens and be cowards. So it's been very important for me to change the way I speak in front of my children. I do see color. Yeah. And what can I do to be part of the change? And how difficult it is to have those conversations. It's uncomfortable to have those conversations because you know you're not going to get it right. And that's okay too. Well, right. And it's even slightly uncomfortable to kind of be on camera and have these conversations. As three white right? people talking about As race. Three white people <laughs> talking about race. Yeah. But, but white people need to talk about whiteness. Mm -hmm. We need to talk about race. Yeah. We need to take responsibility. And it's, and it's hard because it kind of puts it out there and we could, mm -hmm. some people could get angry. Yes. And they could be like, well, you know, we don't agree with this, but this is our perspective and this is our understanding and this is our journey. Yeah. The one thing that kind of, I guess I'm, I'm curious about um, is 
We don't talk about this much, but I think it's something we, we should talk about is like white guilt. Mm. Um, I think when I first started doing this work, and I have to say I feel like a bit like a toddler in this work, even though I've been doing it for almost 30 years, which is kind of strange. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm just learning to walk, yeah. right? And sometimes I'm still on the ground crawling. But I, I went through that period of white guilt and feeling guilty because I was white about what my ancestors did, you know, even mm -hmm. what some of my family members were involved in and ancestry. Um, have you experienced that or are you experiencing it? And what have, what have you done? Because like to live and act out of a place of guilt, I've realized also from kind of a spiritual or human, divine or human foundation mm -hmm. really isn't Productive. It's, it's not, not productive. productive. No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't find the word, but yeah. you're right. It's not productive. Yeah. yeah. I don't think guilt, I don't think I've ever had guilt. It's been more of a call to action for me, okay. especially centered around social justice. Cool. Prison, because my, my master's is in criminal justice. So I think that's where I probably relate the most. Yeah. Or, you know, watching those videos. They had done a, a documentary on Netflix not long ago, and I remember there being a picture of the prison in. I think it was Alabama, and they panned out, and there was two white men on a horse, and everybody in the field was like one white person, everybody else was black, and I'm like, my goodness, this is like, this is, we're just doing the same thing in history again, yeah. right here, and like, so systematic racism is probably, and social injustices is probably where I kind of, so to me it's more of a call to action. I don't know that I feel overwhelming sense of guilt about, I mean, I think if I stay in my ignorance, I should feel guilty about that. Uh, but uh, I think, yeah, no, yeah. I don't feel an overwhelming sense of guilt, I don't think. Uh. Yeah, I, w I would say similarly, I, I've always felt a call to, to action mm -hmm. and to social justice around racism. Um, and I think, I think, yeah, like we, like we mentioned, it's, it's easy for people to kind of respond in, in a negative way when they feel like you are trying to make them feel guilty about what they've done. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that, yeah. it's it's like what you hear on Fox News, yeah. they don't want to feel guilty, they don't want to feel like there's moral and moral attributes to their race. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I think what, what I've learned through kind of studying about like white fragility and colorblind racism is that those are those are kind of misconceptions, and it's a it's a flaw in the logic around understanding your role in racism. Mm -hmm. So to be to be able to have white people like ourselves who can enter with that understanding and compassion and be willing to dig in and explore what race and racism mean to white people and how we can kind of shift the narratives around race because it's not enough for people to say I don't see color right. that doesn't do anything no, to further the, mm -hmm. the goal of anti-racism so to be able to have people like us who can dig in and 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 kind of parse that out is really important mm -hmm. yeah I would encourage you to um, to kind of do your own digging, right? Yeah. Plenty of places we could dig. Please, yes. Make sure you're kind of digging in the places that are, are authentic and real, right? Mm -hmm. And that really give you the real story. But there's a great book that was written about white fragility <clears throat> that is pretty, it, it's been kind of a fascinating, almost kind of starting point for folks. Mm -hmm. You know, because part of our fragility as white people is that we don't have to face these things because white is the predominant culture. Yeah. We don't have to really think about it. We can settle back and say, well, I want some time to think about that. Whereas if you have black or brown skin or, mm -hmm. you know, if you're a person of, of any sort of color, you, you oftentimes have to walk in a world responding to whiteness each minute of the day. Yeah. You don't have opportunities to just step back and say, let me think about that. So yeah. that's one thing I learned from a, from a group of, of beautiful black women when they said, you know, James, you can go away and you can say, hey, I need some time to think about this. We don't have that privilege, right? Yeah. And so I think that's important. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of maybe our, our any last thoughts um, on this topic of whiteness or maybe why um, this has been an important part of your journey? And I kind of maybe how it relates to the work we do here. Yeah. I know what's really interesting about the Micah Day Center that we're sitting in um, for Back Bay 
is the vast majority of individuals that access services here are white older men. Mm -hmm. um, and in some of our services in the other buildings, we find especially single women of color accessing services, but here it's mostly single white, male. white males mm -hmm. um, accessing services around homelessness, around unsheltered, right? Um, and, and all the services that we provide here. Um, so I think that's kind of an interesting point. But what are some of your, your thoughts on how it relates to the work you do in the world and maybe the way you walk in the world? I had to put down this idea that I don't, okay, so this is gonna sound crazy. I did not think I had white privilege because like in my brain, I was like, I don't understand that because I grew up poor and I grew up in a not good situation. I'm like, I don't understand this privilege. I see the white kids driving the cars and I see the kids, white kids with the money. I don't have that. And then when I started to educate myself, I realized, and I think a lot of people need to understand that, that's not the privilege. The privilege is the benefit of the doubt. I can walk into a room, they're not gonna say, well, you're well-spoken you know, for a white person, and they're not gonna grab their bags, and they're not going to look at you walking down the roads and click the lock button and not make eye contact, and that's the privilege. I'm gonna get an interview based on my name where another person may not get an interview because their name sounds black. That is the privilege. And I think for me, I, it took a lot to understand that. Because I kept coming, I don't understand this white privilege. I did not grow up privileged. <laughs> so I was like, so it's like really, I think a lot of it for me being white is taking the time to listen to the other side and hear what they're saying and then digging deep in myself because we, we have implicit biases. We're all, we all have biases. That's not a good or bad thing one way or the other unless you're unwilling to admit that you have a bias, you know? So we grow up in a predominantly white culture with a lot of, it's a white culture, okay? So how can we be part of the change? And when I come in here at Back Bay or I'm out on the streets and you're in the communities and you, especially I would say here in East Biloxi, East Biloxi which I would say is predominantly African American, you don't have grocery stores. You don't have, you don't, I know the Boys and Girls Trips trying to come back. You don't have the things in place to make the community thrive, but then get frustrated when there's crime and poverty. But we're not doing anything to change that circle of a system right. that we're in. Right. And if I have cocaine in my bag and a black man has crack, he's gonna go to jail for 50 years and I'm gonna, you know, get slapped on the wrist and hear some probation. How do you change a whole system? a flawed system that the government set up to fail. The government set up a racist system. Here, we're gonna desegregate, but here we're gonna put all these racist things into play that basically do the same thing. How do you change a whole system? And then I had to stop my thinking, I don't have to change the whole system, I have to start somewhere, right? So I think we have to get into the communities more. And I look out here and I think, what do we do for East Biloxi? We, we work in East Biloxi, we spend our time in East Biloxi, I don't spend my money in East Biloxi. I don't come over here for grocery stores and things like that. How do we change the community to reflect their needs, not what we think they need? What are their needs and how do we fix it? How do we get the fathers out of prison? How do we bring nuclear families back together? And you know, I think we don't have a lot of, they have a beautiful culture and a beautiful community of people that you don't always see in white cultures. Like, they stay together, they're big families, they're like, they look out for each other in a way that I've never, I've not experienced in my family. And, you know, I'm married to an African American, I'm raising biracial children. These conversations are so important. They're, they're important yeah. in my home, they're important when we go out into the community as a couple. Um, Cause I used to get mad at him for saying words that I was like, oh, that's, I can't say that, I can't say the N word. He's like, yes I can, I'm like, I don't like that word. <laughs> I don't like that word. And I remember Dr. Graham's actually the one that told me, let him be who he is. And I was like, okay, I won't, I won't get involved in it then. And so it's him and I, when we go out in the community, can represent something really beautiful when yeah. we're doing work together. When he's in here and I'm in here in the day center, he's volunteering. I hope people see us as that and that we're leading by example and living an example because I've been disowned. I mean, half my family has disowned me for this relationship. So. And then the other half, which has been really an interesting thing, the other half of my family, who was like, oh, we're not really crazy about your parent black man, have really like, you know what it is? I think like you had a lot of, um, 
you had a lot of time in the culture. You had a lot of like the, your family that you made. My family were very much removed from it, and I think exposure is important. The more yeah. we come, the more they're like, I really yep. like that guy. You know, he's a lot like me. And I'm like, oh, gosh, I've been saying that. You know, so exposure is important. I think exposing ourselves into the community um, and having these, be willing to have these conversations that you know you're going to get kicked back from. I know I'm not going to say it right. I'm going to say things like, I don't see color. And then they're going to be like, let me tell you why that's not appropriate. <laughs> and you have to be willing to hear it. Yep. You have to be willing yep. to hear why that's not appropriate. And you have to stop waiting right. for them to educate you. And you have to do the hard work on your own. But I really hope in this community, especially where we see a lot of poverty and we see a lot of this socioeconomic <clears throat> stuff, that we can start to change that we live here. I mean, we work here, we're yep. here, we live here. We need to start doing something. Yep. And shout out to, there's a group called the East Biloxi Initiative that we're a part of at Back Bay. Yep. And so to kind of bring some of that change. Yep. And I think Bell Hooks, who's, who's a fabulous author, if you've never read her work, please do so. She says, she, she has this book that, that talks that it's not about race, it's about class. But that's involved in this whole conversation too. Mm -hmm. It's kind of what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. It's classism and it's in a neighborhood here that we're in East Biloxi, which is primarily black and Vietnamese, Vietnamese people of yeah. color. Mm -hmm. And so here you don't find resources, you don't find services. And so that keeps people in poverty, right? Mm -hmm. You don't find good paying jobs. So what are your kind of closing thoughts? I think, so for me coming from a social work kind of perspective, it's really important to provide culturally relevant services. Um, and cultural competency, of course, is not an end-all be-all like we've talked about. It's, it's a constant process of learning. And I think being aware of, you know, who is in our community, who we're trying to serve, and also being open to feedback and listening to the needs that are being presented and not trying to just kind of assume or guess needs all comes into that culturally relevant cultural relevancy. Um, so for for me coming in, you know, I I understand I have a privilege and I'm also seen as kind of a trustworthy person as, you know, a white woman social worker. It's kind of it's kind of the norm. Um, but I still want every relationship to be a give and take of who, who are you, who am I, and how do we meet to work towards your needs, your goals, um, whatever they may be, because not everyone's goals and needs are going to be the same thing. And if, if my race or their race comes into conflict, that's important to address. If they don't trust me because I'm white, we we can talk about that. If I maybe made an assumption about them because they're a different race than I am, that's something that we should reflect on. Um, so so it's it's a process, and I think having conversations like this among staff members is really important, and even having you know guidelines and statements about what. Um, what the diversity and inclusion and anti-racism and anti-oppression policies are um, and doing regular reviews of the policies to see if a policy is negatively impacting one group over the other maybe I mean I'm curious whether you know are our homeless black individuals in this community not coming to the day center because of something that we could change. I thought know? about that. So, mm -hmm. so I think it's, it's I think it's that. important to yeah. to dig, dig yeah. in and have those conversations <clears throat> and be open to hearing that feedback. Mm -hmm. That's great and actually since you're here watching this because you're interested in Back Bay, that's an area where we're we're moving in that direction. Um, we continue to move in that direction of looking at our policies, looking at our organization, actually starting the really difficult, deep work of talking about race mm -hmm. and talking about systemic racism and how it's affected us mm -hmm. and how we're a part of that as an agency, as an organization. We're gonna be starting those conversations. We were um, this past month, right August, we had three sessions set up where that was gonna be pretty much the thrust of it, but COVID, COVID-2, the Delta, <laughs> kind of knocked that out, right? So 
Um, but we got something scheduled next next month, and or actually this month, and then kind of moving on from there. So, be with us on the journey. Really grateful you joined you joined us for this. Um, and hopefully this is just kind of a tutorial and a starter, mm -hmm. and it really needs to be white people talking about whiteness. Um, we appreciate you you being a part of this, engaging. Certainly send this out to other folks if you'd like, or if you want to respond to us and challenge us. We love to be ch I love, love to be challenge. challenged, right? Love challenge. So challenge <laughs> us um, and write back or send us a note and respond and let us know thumbs up, thumbs down, or, or any clarification. So. Thank you for joining us. Um, we love doing these. I love doing these. Mm -hmm. I don't really love cameras, mm -mm. but like how do you avoid it? How do you I just, right? I just look here. Yeah. <laughs> so how do, googly eyes. How do we get the word out, right? <laughs> how do we how do we share um, our understandings and, and our culture here at Back Bay without mm -hmm. this? So thank you, Kevin, for sitting behind the camera all the time <laughs> and nodding your head when we're saying something yeah. right. Yeah. So blessings on your day. Um, and just really enjoy it and, and take this to heart and think mm -hmm. and dig and dig into your own soul and heart and spirit, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you.